Welcome to Monticello Podcasts, where we look at various aspects of Monticello, Thomas Jefferson, and the work of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which has owned and operated in Monticello since 1923. I'm Chad Woolerton, Monticello's webmaster. Our subject today is the creation of databases to promote the study and understanding of history, and in this case, the history of slavery in Virginia and the United States. Here today to talk about this subject are Senator Stanton, Marie Tyler McGraw, and Henry Winsack. Senator Stanton is the senior, Shannon Senior Historian here at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. She is the author of Slavery at Monticello and Free Someday, the African American Families at Monticello. She's currently finishing a new book on Getting Word, a project to locate and record the oral histories of the descendants of Monticello's enslaved African community. And she's the project manager and originator of the Monticello Plantation Database, an online feature of Monticello.org. Marie Tyler McGraw has worked as a historian for the National Park Service and the Ballantyne Museum in Richmond. She is the author of At the Falls, Richmond, Virginia, and Its People, and co-author of In Bondage and Freedom, Antebellum Black Life in Richmond, 1790 through 1860. Some of her more recent work has been on the American Colonization Society, a 19th century group that sponsored efforts to send free American blacks to colonize Liberia. She too has been working on a database, one that focuses specifically on records relating to these immigrants bound for Liberia. And Henry Winsack is an author and historian whose recent work has focused on slavery and its legacy in America. His book, The Harristons, An American Family in Black and White, won the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1999. And his latest book, An Imperfect God, George Washington, His Slaves, and the Creation of America, earned him a Los Angeles Times Book Award for History. To my knowledge, Henry hasn't created a database, but he claims to be a frequent user of the Monticello Plantation Database. Welcome, and thanks for participating. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll get the three of you to ask each other a couple of questions, but I thought I'd start by asking um, Cinder and Marie to describe their databases um, respectively. And so I'll start with Cinder as the home team player here. <laughs> well, um, it started with the database itself. Uh, back in 1996, we realized that Jefferson had left a remarkable document, what he called his farm book, which is less to do with agriculture than with managing his plantation. And it has, uh, year after year, the names of enslaved people uh, grouped by family. And a lot of cut and dried records, like uh, how, how many pecks of cornmeal to give to each person, how, how many yards of linen to provide for them. But these very dry records have uh, given historians today a wonderful uh, understanding of the human dimension of slavery because of the lists uh, giving family relationships, birth and death dates, occupation. And so putting all of that into a database became a priority about 10 years ago, and students from the university entered the data over the years. And just in this past year, we have put that information into a website to make it accessible to the general public. Okay. And Marie, would you describe your database just a little bit? Happy to. And like Cinder's, it has its origins in documents. Uh, I was researching the Virginia immigrants to Liberia, more or less sponsored by the American Colonization Society in the early 19th century, and noticed that well, notice two things. One was that the ship's lists were reasonably thorough in listing who was going to Liberia, their ages, many times what part of the state they were from, the family members who went with them. Did they have any skills? Remarkably, they frequently did. Uh, did they have any reading and writing skills as well as uh, occupational skills? So all that, and sometimes whether or not they were Presbyterians or Methodists, was also <laughs> listed in the, in the ship's list. This is particularly interesting because of the 35 to 3,700 people who left Virginia for Liberia, 
about 2,500 were enslaved. That means they were never in the census. They might have been in somebody's plantation list, they may have been in a will or property listing, but they were not in the census. So this was a nice body of information. The other 1,000 roughly already had, they were in the census, but so anyhow, this is was one revelation via document. And then, happily for me, a lot of this work in a very basic manner had been done in the 80s by a man named Tom Schick who took the ship's list and made an alphabetical listing. And all I had to do for the first part was pull out those up to 1843 and then later another gentleman picked up his work, Robert Brown, I believe, and did it to 1865. So that was a start. That was a core. And then we went to letters, documents, uh, documents at the Library of Congress and, and, and in Charlottesville and Richmond, state documents, et cetera, and filled in, filled in, and filled in, and found a great deal more, and found many interesting aspects of, of their lives in related documents. Right. That's one of the things that I kind of find is fun with a database is you can take a core of information and then start pulling things together and making these really solid ties. Um, uh, so that, to me, that's one of the benefits of going to a database, but I wanted to ask you both, you, Cinder, and Marie, what you thought you were going to be doing uh, getting into a database. Why go to a database rather than write a book or write some articles? Um, and Henry can chime in on this because he, um, he uses uh, the Monticello Plantation database and um, uh, gets hopefully gets some information out of it. Oh, I do. I do. Uh, I, I want to go back to your in, initial statement, though. I mean, it wasn't until you said that I had never made a database that I realized that I had. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and it, it was because when I was doing the research for my book on the Hairston family, I came across a family document that uh, turned out to be a genealogy of an African-American family covering five generations. Mm -hmm which I didn't realize until I took this document, which was a one-page handwritten document. It was just a list of names uh, that was written up in 1854. And next to the names, it had the age of, of each person. And I typed that into my computer. And by then, massaging it in different ways, first making it an alphabetical list and then breaking it down by age groups, I was able to tease out the existence of family subgroups within this lists that were not apparent before. And then when I alphabetized the names, I was able more easily to make connections between the people on that list and the people on other family trees that had been given to me by family members or that I had gotten out of other uh, databases. So, But it was only when I, I sat down and, and transcribed that and put it into a computer format where I could do different things with it that the real, the, the, the meaning of it really emerged. Okay. Did you find anything like that, Cinder, in some of what you've been doing? Well, I think the first thing we found out uh, back at the beginning, I mean, just taking this docu one document, the farm book, which is the core of the database, we use lots of other mm -hmm. manuscripts and documents as well, um, was how many slaves did Jefferson consider, or how many human beings did Jefferson consider his property in the course of his life? And nobody had come up with a total really? before. Just estimates before. Just estimates, yeah. And uh, came up with the number 607 that first time round, which was <laughs> surprising enough. It's a lot of people. It is. Um, and that, so it was only through the form of the database that allowed us to kind of track over 60 years of Jefferson's lifetime, all of that. It also showed us that 400 of these people had lived at one time or another here at Monticello. Wow. Uh, so... That's the kind of thing that actually, you know, putting it in, into the form of uh, an access database made possible. And Marie? Well, I, this is a chance to say what I is, is always on the back of my mind about this sort of thing is I can remember a time when I was first doing history and people say, you couldn't do African American history. There's just no records. There's no right. information out there. It's a lost cause. And I think in the last 15 years, maybe even 20, we have just seen what a vast amount of material there is if you just think creatively and use it. So, I, But I think in many cases, you, you have to be willing to sort through a lot of material in order to do that. Once you do, it seems only right to share it in the form of sharing your database, putting it in some form that people can get to it, such as a website, mm -hmm. because 
they can take this, what you have done so far, and go further with it, which is the goal, I would think. Right. Well, beyond the lists, um, and it seems like the, 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 the list from the ships is pretty, you know, pretty apparent. You know, you got something there. That's right. What are the kinds of things would you sort through, and what, I mean, where would you, what pieces of information would you be hunting for? This is, these are decisions we're making right now. There are some <laughs> primary sources, such as the American Colonization Society papers at the Library of Congress that we will definitely cite and as specifically as possible for some people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a few other documentary uh, public records, and then we'll have a bibliography. We'll say, here are X many of the best books on this subject to get you started and get you give you some context and perhaps list some other places where you, they can get. We will try to cross-link with other collections of documents uh, mm -hmm. letters from Liberia online. Now, hmm. you know, we cannot do everything, partly because we don't know everything, but we can get people pointed in the direction that they want to go, and many will have many different kinds of users, we hope. Mm -hmm. So we hope we can give all of them some sense of where they should go from here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Henry, I want to ask uh, if you, you claim to be a frequent user of the Monticello Plantation Database. What have you used it for? Uh, I've used it most uh, recently, actually, to trace uh, some of Jefferson's slaves who lived at Poplar Forest, his retreat, which is 90 miles south of here. Right, and I should actually, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but I should mention that you're actually working on a book. That's right. I'm Jefferson working on slavery. That's right. I'm working on a book right now on Jefferson and his slaves. And so uh, I was delighted when Cinder let me know <laughs> a few months ago that I could test drive a prototype of this. Uh, and... It is extraordinarily uh, useful because it puts at your, at your fingertips uh, information that, that historians and researchers really need, the basic, basic, basic information like when was someone born, where was she born, who are her parents, do we know who her parents are, right. where does she appear in which records from year to year to year. Uh, the, the other thing, the, in many cases, the most fascinating thing that emerges from assembling these databases is to learn what we don't know. Right. Uh, is that it's only when you compile this information that you see that a certain number of people just vanish, and we don't know why. I mean, I uh, I've been, as I mentioned, working on the community at, at Poplar Forest, and there's a woman named Hannah who was literate and who mm -hmm. wrote a letter to yes. Jefferson, and I think the last her last appearance in the records is in an appraisal list that was ordered in 1823, and after that we don't know what happens to her. Her, f her first husband, Solomon, simply is there one year, and the next year he's gone. Uh, did he die? Was he sold? Did he run away? We don't know. Uh, and th this this is a reality check to historians uh, in, in, in one sense, because we, it's, it's a lesson. Don't go beyond what you know and, uh, and realize how much, how much we don't know. And it's also it's an arrow pointing towards further research that needs to be done. Yeah, I think the gaps in the information, I mean, it, it, this really does show the gaps. And um, I think your database is similar, Marie, but ours is totally records-based. Mm -hmm. So if there isn't a, a record of something, it's not in the, in the database. So you get some very strange um, empty spots in somebody's life when really we know they're still at Monticello making nails or whatever it is, but there's no record of it in those particular years. So this is one of the aspects of, of the database that we, we kind of puzzle over and wonder what to do about it. Uh, and the whole issue that, that we've talked about before, of how do you combine this uh, data with narratives and stories mm -hmm. that, that uh, can really tell you more. I mean, you have have sort of constructed a life for Hannah from some of the data, but uh, there may be more out there that would, in letters or something that is not strictly fit in a database. This is so. This is one of the conflict areas for us, I guess. Well, a database can't do everything. I mean, that's uh -huh. uh, and it, I mean, ideally. Uh, the database maybe in the future but would have links to other material, but that's mm -hmm. that's not what you've set out to do right now. And uh, just just what you've done, I think, is magnificent because I've had so much 
uh, luck using it. Just the other day, there was a query on the Internet from an historian who was asking, well, I think, how many slaves did Jefferson sell? And someone right away wrote in and said, well, you should try the new Monticello database and just click under a life event. <laughs> and it won't give sold. you the right answer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, because... Because it doesn't have... Uh, because um, the sale after Jefferson's death of yes. 130 people, there are only fragmentary records. So mm-hmm. we've only recorded 30 or 40, and that misses out. Well, but his other. question was, how many did Jefferson sell during, during his, his lifetime? Life. Yeah. So right. uh, you would answer that. No, you're, I see. Yeah. Is, is the farm? A really quick question: Is the farm book the only, uh, the best place to go for that information, or would you sometimes have to go to memorandum books? Oh, we use Jefferson's memorandum books. His list of um, expenditures is what that is, and countless letters, public records as well, and the Getting Word project that you mentioned. Right. We've traced through public records. And some of that stuff is in the database as well. Too, yeah, so. and uh, and uh, this is a work in progress. Ours <laughs> is. <laughs> so we're continually correcting be, yeah. and adding. And I was looking at it even this morning. I thought, oh my God, we didn't say that Great George was uh, an overseer. It's not in there yet. Okay. For um, for reasons that I won't bore you with right at the moment. The um, from from Marie's description of her database. I mean, I know you've written you've written about George Washington and uh, you're writing about Jefferson, but you also chronicled uh, a longer period of time through um, your earlier book, uh, Henry. In the Harristons, right? In the Harristons. Um, you know, anything enticing about what she's describing? What Marie is talking yeah, about, absolutely, because one of the uh, the Hairston slave owners sent six slaves to Liberia, and we I need to talk. we need to talk, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I uh, I think through one of the predecessor databases that you mentioned, Marie, I was able to discover that four of them died uh, within a, within a few years of disease over there. But I had a a, a surprising, a startling thing thing happened to me a couple of years ago at UVA. I was at, a, at, a, at an event, an African American literary event, and someone came over to me and said, "Oh, there's a woman named Hairston here from Sierra Leone. She's visiting here." And I said, "Oh my gosh, she must be a descendant of one of the slaves that went over there." Uh, but I was never able to track her down. The woman who told me this sort of disappeared, and uh, and then the, the the visitor from Africa was just here in a very short-term visiting fellowship, and she's gone. But I would have loved to have talked to her. But maybe through one of these enhanced databases, I can track down her family. Do you what know, what do you stories know they would have to tell? Do you know why he sent them? Uh, he never said why, but he later uh, he had a, uh, a daughter with a slave, and then uh, on his deathbed he set that young girl free and gave her all of his slaves. So I think he was already thinking of, uh, in terms of emancipating slaves, even you know 20 years before he died, which is when this uh, shipment to Liberia t- took place. And, uh, he was very concerned for their for their welfare, and he also had to sneak them out because he was afraid, apparently, that his family would try to stop him. Right. Oh. Yeah. This is two things that have come out of the Virginia research, which is in a book that's going to come out next year. I'm not sure what the title is going to be, but oh. I think it's going to be Africa in black in black and white. Um, two things that I learned about Virginia is that people were afraid to emancipate slaves openly and and send them to Liberia. It made a bad impression in the neighborhood. The neighbors didn't like it. And when colonization material came in in Virginia post office, sometimes the postmaster would say, would refuse to accept it, or the neighbors would complain and say it was inflammatory and they didn't want people to see it. So there are many letters in this collection that said, I want to do this, but I don't want you to write back to me at my post office address with any kind of marking on the envelope. We have to do this very quietly. There was a... A climate of fear around stirring up the question of slavery grows in Virginia from 1820 to 1860, and you can see that this is seen as upsetting. If if people are leaving for Liberia, what does that? How does that affect the enslaved people on other nearby farms and? Would that have been true for just freeing your slaves in general? For what? In ge- just freeing your slaves in general, rather than just sending them abroad and letting them go. Oh, I think any kind of emancipation, but it became in Virginia because they had to leave within a year right. unless they got special dispensation. Uh, and this was more v- visible, it was a bigger deal, it would yeah. appear in the newspaper, etc. Okay. I think in, in terms of the sti- statistical information that people can glean from mm-hmm. these databases, you know, I mentioned the more than 600. Um, enslaved men, women, and children on Jefferson's plantations. And in terms of numbers, 
I think that the number of right. African Americans who went to Liberia from Virginia is... 3,700, that's uh, out of 11,000. They, they were the dominant group, and once they got here, this is quite interesting, they really re recreated a Virginia slash American uh, political and cultural system there. Uh, they want, needed to get away from it, and yet it was what they admired in many ways. Interesting. Mm -hmm. the, um, one of the things, a comment that I read many years ago, um, based on work here, probably it's, it could be Cinder's words, is the, the um, we don't really know about, much about people, I mean, we're finding more, but we don't really know much about people until they emerge from slavery. And then all of a sudden there's these, these sort of like, almost like born whole. Um, when you find something like the, uh, the list of the ships and they give you all this information, are you, how are you able to link that back into the more, the darker period that's harder to see into? What can you, what do you get, well, what can you tell people? Well, we're immensely helped by the fact that you get often get the emancipator's name, and then you can check for that person's records, see who else might have been there. Also, by the fact that there were a number of letters written back if people could not write themselves, and a good percentage, probably 20 to 25 percent of the immigrants to Liberia were able to write their own letters, at right. least. And then they would have other people who were professional letter writers write for them, and they would reference, tick off their relatives, say hello to so and so and to so and so, and has so and so been married yet? It's uh, as Sinner as suggests; these are not the final answer to any historical question, right. but they just open up a great many avenues that were not apparent recently right. until so, recently. Okay. From, for me, one of the most important things that comes out of um, Cinder's Monticello database is seeing in a graphic form on the page family structures because if you're just looking in the farm book, uh, what you see are a long list of names. The other point I want to make is that it's interesting that how much information that we get from slavery time comes in the form of lists, uh, you know, annual censuses, tithables, blanket lists, death lists, birth lists. Uh, it's one list after another. So when Cinder does this, it puts it in this form where we can break out family structures. That, that gives you a whole, we see things that do not emerge from the master or the mistress's lists very clearly right. because they were not all that interested in recording family structures. And we are, and it's only when someone like Cinder comes along and puts it in that form that we see patterns that are otherwise very hidden in the original records. And the family information that Jefferson himself did put into the farm book is totally accidental. Uh, he was doing it so that he could see the ages of children mm -hmm. and know that uh, you know a two-year-old only needed a yard of linen <laughs> and a ten-year-old needed two enough, yards, yeah. uh, and those were his motivations. And so all of this, the the family data that we could then make more accessible is completely a bonus, an accident. Okay, so what's missing from databases? The well, human element. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to try to put in the human element. I think what you can do with them remains problematic, and we were talking about this, um, the problem of how can you, what kinds of con statistics can you reasonably expect to do? There may be some loss of function between the database and its website version that is likely to get out to people, and we just have to caution people in some kind of introductory statement that this can't do everything, mm -hmm. uh, or, or maybe as much as we want it to do. Right. And the second thing is, uh, this is an example of where I thought I had had a bright idea, and it wasn't <laughs> such a bright idea. I thought that if I looked at the age of the oldest child and then looked at the age of the mother, I could calculate... Uh, average date of uh, first childbirth for women. Was it 17, 18, 16? What well, was it? Mm -hmm. uh, but then I read a little more in the letters and I learned a great deal. Uh, the first child may be a stepchild. Uh, the first two children may not have gone to Liberia. They might have died. They might have been living someplace else and not part of it. There is no way to know if this is the whole story right. unless there is a big batch of letters behind that that group, mm -hmm. and that's only the case maybe one in five times. That's a good caution, though. I mean, that not everything mm -hmm. is there. Ab so you absolutely. Can't. But I think these kinds of databases can begin to give us a better understanding of questions like that mm -hmm. and life expectancy. Mm -hmm. um, the the Monticello Plantation database 
is eventually intended to be exactly that, the, the whole plantation, mm -hmm. not just the enslaved population, but the other um, the free people who lived on the plantation, overseers and millers, uh, the crops and livestock, all of that, so that one can make uh, comparisons uh, between periods, how d how did enslaved people fare under uh, a certain overseer or in a tenancy situation if that when they were leased out as compared for, to when Jefferson had complete control? And those are the kinds of questions as this gets refined. And tobacco that I think versus it, grain, which is always a right, question. Yeah. Um, did, when their diet changed, what, right. what happened right. to the population? So I think this is what we're aiming for eventually, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of refinement that we'll have to go go through mm -hmm. before we get to that stage. Okay. Any last words on this? We look forward to other forms of databases that are related and can be linked together getting Absolutely. out in the next few years. I think we all should be alert for that and encourage folks to do it. Do you know if anybody else is doing things like this? You two know each other. But. Yeah. <laughs> Not at this moment, but I always feel it's just about to happen. That's <laughs> the next good list. Maybe, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it might be something like the, the runaways that lists, 18th century runaway lists that are going on the web from uh, Virginia Center for Digital History, mm -hmm. and then taking that into the 19th century. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't know of any uh, anything else. I mean, I'm sure that there are people that work on things like this. Um, the fortunate thing is that Monticello has su such rich records to, to draw upon, uh, and you know there are other fam there are other collections of plantation family papers that could offer similar um, um, you know pools of data to put together a, a database. But it's an awful lot of work, and you know, yes, yeah. and Ten so years. ten years. Mm -hmm. Ten years for <laughs> ten years for the Longtail Foundation <laughs> database. Yeah. yeah, well, with the help Us. of the Institute for Public History at UVA, right. I should mm -hmm. mention their their students have been really great. And um, I do want to mention about the database in its current form as a website. I think it's what it's most useful for now is finding individuals and learning about individuals, uh, learning that somebody had a surname that maybe nobody knew about before. It gives names to enslaved people. It gives them a voice in a way that uh, that's harder to recover from just a straight document that hasn't been interpreted or put in some kind of organized form like this. All right, well, Senator, thanks. Marie, we look forward to your database appearing online. And we're waiting. <laughs> I am too. Thanks again. Of course. Oh, thank you. Thank you.